That's my old roommate right there. <laughs> I could tell you a lot of stories about Lee, but I won't. <clears throat> but Lee, thank you for I'm so delighted to be here. Mike asked me about a year ago if I would speak tonight. And I, I said to him, I said, are you sure what you're asking? I'll be just shy of 80, and you'd sure better have another sermon in your hip pocket. <laughs> But thank you, Mike, for giving me this privilege. Uh, I know I'm coming down to the end of my time, and each of these presentations like this mean the world to me. You know, the other night, Rick Mars talked about Mike asking him to start the series with the Song of Solomon, or uh, the Song of Songs on sex. And I just wonder, Rick, how you would have felt about being asked to close it with lamentations <laughs> full of suffering, destruction, women boiling their babies, utter rejection, and death. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd take sex anytime. <laughs> and I would say, and I'm single, but I'm not going to go there. Pliny the Elder reportedly said, life is easy, but navigation is hard. Now, at the time Pliny lived, I suppose life was hard too, but he said navigation is harder. But of course, now we've got a GPS, and all we have to do is just punch in where it is we want to go, and then if we get off track... A little voice comes on that says, recalculating. <laughs> I was trying to find my way in Tennessee to a little church, and she came on and said, recalculating so many times that finally she said, your navigation is now ending. <laughs> Hurt my feelings. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I felt like I heard a little attitude uh, in, in, in her voice. Before us tonight is this book of Lamentations. It is the horrific account of naviga navigation that has gone terribly wrong. The city of Jerusalem lies in total ruins. They had heard the recalculating message from the prophets over and over and over, but their words had fallen on deaf ears. And as I read through this short book, I'm immediately struck with two things. Number one, the incredible ability of God's people to mess up. <laughs> over and over, the Bible records of them messing up and going astray. But secondly, the appearance of love among the ruins. So let's get a little feel for the book. The title, Lamentations, gives us our first clue, lament, profound sorrow, suffering, grief. And the words found here are among the starkest, most poignant words for suffering ever recorded anywhere. And worst of all, God is silent. His voice appears nowhere in the book. 
The book has five chapters, each a poem, each in the form of an acrostic that's based on the Hebrew alphabet. So in terms of literature, Lamentations is a work of art. And it's interesting that at a moment of greatest suffering, the author turned to poetry. Lamentations was written over 2,500 years ago. Scholars locate it around 586 before the Common Era, perhaps following the destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonian army, or at a time of similar calamity. And the city lies in ruins, and the people are bewildered beyond all imagination, confused, and they knew what had happened was their own fault. But the magnitude, still the magnitude of the devastation was unspeakable. And so I want to give you a few of the sentiments that are just found in this book. And I'll, I'll, I'll give them basically without comment. Such statements as, How like a widow she has become. She that was great among the nations. The Lord has made her suffer. See how worthless I have become? The Lord has destroyed all of the dwellings of Jacob. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. Vast is the sea of your ruin. And then they were mocked by outsiders with the words, Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? And again, I've forgotten what happiness is. Gone is my glory and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. Women have boiled their offspring. They became their food in the destruction of my people. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to aliens. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned to mourning. And then why have you forgotten us? Why have you forsaken us these many days? Restore us unless you have rejected us utterly and are angry with us beyond measure. Those are the kinds of words that fill every page of the book with one exception. A few words are found in chapter 3 that have become the best-known and best-loved words, perhaps, of all Scripture. And those words are these, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. We'll return to those few words in a moment. But with millions turning away from organized religion, away from our churches, including many of our children who were reared in churches, here is my primary concern tonight. If Israel made mistakes that resulted in the loss of their place in the world and the suffering that we find here, how can we today avoid making those same mistakes that could lead to the loss of our credibility in our world and to an eclipse of faith in God in our time, an eclipse that appears to have already begun. So tonight we'll look at three things. We'll look at the suffering and silence of God. We'll look at that diamond of steadfast love. And we'll look at how love works in the daily navigation of our lives. First of all, suffering. The book provides a window on inexplicable suffering. This world is a place of tears. A baby enters the world 
with a cry. And lament is, in its essence, a cry. And especially suffering that defies comprehension. We think of things like the Holocaust or 9-11 or the shootings in Newtown, Connecticut or in Orlando or in San Bernardino or flooding. And it's during these times that, oddly enough, people who cannot find words turn to the book of Lamentations. Suffering comes to us in so many ways, doesn't it? One we love with all our hearts becomes ill and suffers. A suffering that can leave us bewildered, speechless, and wondering why. Or we lose a child. I remember I was still in my early 20s when there was a lovely young couple with a lovely four-year-old girl who became so ill, her color turned, and she suffered on and on and on and then died. There are no words. In such a moment, the sufferer is stunned numb, empty, all the supports that have held us before are ripped away, and nothing helps. Aeschylus, the ancient Greek tragedian who lived actually not long after Lamentations was written, wrote these words, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart, until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom by the awful grace of God. We can sometimes ask, though, does wisdom come? Maybe not a wisdom that explains the suffering, but maybe, in time, a wisdom that can keep us from losing our whole life for our own sake as well as for those who are around us. So here in Lamentations, they suffer, and their suffering takes them to this question of God's silence, God's absence. And yet, when we suffer like that, this is the moment that we need to hear from God most in the good times, we can sort of tolerate the silence. We can tolerate the absence. But in suffering, the silence is intolerable because we're left utterly and completely alone with nothing but self. And we need to remember that self is not nothing. It has vast resources. But we are forced to go deeper into that self than we had ever gone. And we discover things about ourselves that we had never had reason to notice before. And we feel things about God that we never felt before. I know personally that longing, that need that we have deep in ourselves for something that we call God. But we need a God who is near, not far. We need a God who sighs, not a wordy God. We need a God who can come to that place inside us that no one else can come. That's the God that we need. But in our time, this question of silence and absence has moved even beyond the question of suffering to a philosophical denial of God altogether. I was in the early stages of my work in the 60s 
when on the April 8th, 1966 issue of Time magazine, the words were emblazoned, God is dead. It created an enormous earthquake. I read all the literature that they wrote to support that theory, and that idea has continued, and today, an exclusive humanism and the philosophy of atheism are on the rise with greater intellectual force than ever. Charles Taylor Taylor has sort of tracked this through the last 500 years in his impressive volume entitled A Secular Age. But someone says, well, but we have the Bible. Isn't the Bible the voice of God? And how careful we must be there. We must be careful here that we do not make the Bible an idol that in actuality replaces God. One can find some verse of Scripture that seems to support almost any crazy idea and present it as the voice of God. That is an idolatrous use of the Bible. It's as if the Bible, we cannot see the forest of God's love for all the trees of verses. The Bible takes us to God's steadfast love and a mercy that never ceases. And it is important for us to remember that the Bible does not say, for God so loved the world that He gave us a book. The Bible says that God gave us a Son, a living, breathing, speaking, loving, touching Son, a human being. And so we return to those beautiful words and lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. And these are the words that give us the clue on how to navigate our lives in the world today. So let's look at them a little more closely. Jesus looks at this whole book. He looks at all of Scripture. And he says, the great commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That's the steadfast love of God that never ceases. Paul will repeat this in the great book of Galatians and in Romans. He said in the midst of all his lofty arguments, it all comes down to this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. But what does it mean? It rolls off our tongue so easily. But what does it mean? Israel had, rep- had repeated those words over and over, perhaps even daily, and yet lost their way. Today, Is this simply a sermon that we hear on Sunday, words we recite, just another part of our religion? Or does this love change us to the very depths of our souls in ways that it did not change Israel? This completely new way of seeing the world, this new way of seeing every human being who is in the world this new language? Has this love changed us? Or do we say, you know, we're f- I'm fine with all this talk of loving Landon, but you know, there are exceptions. There are exceptions when it comes to loving that nasty, obnoxious neighbor next door, or that backstabbing person beside whom I work. That's different. And in those situations, it seems like we want to adopt the stance of the Quaker who said, friend, I love thee, but thou art standing where I'm about to strike. (laughs) So let's push this just a little further. We're not done yet. In John 3, listen to the words, for God so loved the world. And we want to clap our hands and say, yes. But what do the words mean? 
Sometimes I think it is so easy for us to assume that what that means is that God loves the ones we love. So, for example, we love each other, so God loves the world. You know, we love children, so God loves the world. We love, we love the United States of America. Surely God loves the United States of America. And if we are a, dare I say, Republican, you know, we believe that surely God loves all the Republicans. And if it's a Democrat, we think, well, surely God loves the Democrats, although one isn't always sure that God loves the other. And we can, we can see God's love for heterosexuals, but the, the lesbian, the gay, the bisexual, the transsexual, does God's love for the world include them, or should they be marked for ridicule and jokes and abuse and even killed? Now, I hope you won't get all over me for asking things like this. I'm just trying to understand what we mean when we talk about love. If we say God loves Christians, that's easy enough. But does God love Muslims or Buddhists and Hindus? Or is it okay to single them out for massive condemnation? What does love mean? And, you know, sometimes somebody will say, you know, Landon, I hear all of that, but I just wasn't raised that way. But this text is not asking how you were raised, but whether you've been transformed into the image of Christ. Because that transformation enables you to love all those that Jesus loves, all of those that God loves. And we have to ask, are our hearts big enough to do that? Are we so bound up in ourselves, in our own past, our own religion, our own beliefs, our own history, even our own resentments, that we are so preoccupied with that? that we are no longer free to love, we can only talk about it. But Jesus is not through with us yet. He keeps pushing and he says, question, will you love those who don't love you? All the way to your enemies. Will you? Will you? He says, will you do good to those who are not your brothers and sisters? Will you do good to them? He asks, will you do more than others? Will we? He asks, can you be trusted? Can we trust you to love those who are different, those who are other? Or will you try to make them just a little less human? The problem here is small love. Mother Goose puts it this way. Mother Goose? <laughs> Mother Goose says, little ships must hug the shore. Bigger ships may venture more. Jesus is about our loving in a way that ventures more and that finds all our neighbors in the world. He says, don't hug the shore of your own small self, your own small tribe, even your own small church. Die to self. Find the bigger ship that you may venture more. Jesus called to the fishermen in their small boats that had to hug the shore. And he said, I will make you fishers of men. That's the big ship that ventures more. He told the Pharisee that hugged the shore and thanked God he was not like that person standing over there and who was just reciting his religion about what all he did. You remember Johnny Cash used to sing that old song, You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. 
Jesus says, many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, and then they'll rattle off all the religious deeds. Have I not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils. And in your name have done many wonderful works. And Jesus says, depart from me. They hugged the shore that never found their neighbors to love. Jesus said, you can spend your life judging and condemning. That's a little ship that hugs the shore. Instead, he said, you could spend your life forgiving and giving. And that's the big ship that ventures more. He was traveling with some of the disciples and entered a village of the Samaritans. Different culture, different race, different religion, not welcoming to Jesus. And James and John said, Lord, do you want us just to command fire from heaven to come down and consume them? Jesus said, well, maybe not. (laughs) They're our neighbors. Jesus was once asked, who is my neighbor? And then he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The man had been beaten, robbed. You know the story. Religion passes by on the other side. And then Jesus said, a Samaritan. It's the worst, that's the worst example he could have ever given. A Samaritan. They were the ones hated. They were despised. They were made fun of. Is he just trying to make people mad? That's like saying in our time, a man fell among thieves and an undocumented worker came by. A gay person came by. A Muslim came by. If a Muslim had come by, then we would be reading the story of the good Muslim. You know, when you're 80, you can say these kinds of things. (laughs) But they bent over him, and they dressed his wounds, and they loved him. And do you know what that is? That's someone who's practicing the great commandment, loving God and loving neighbor as self. And you know, the great thing about it is Jesus was never stumped when he met a human being. No matter who the human being was, no matter what the human being had done, and neither should we be. You know the story of the woman caught in the very act of adultery. She was dragged to Jesus by persons. They had found a scripture. They had found a scripture that condemned her, and they hugged it and hugged it and justified filling their hands with stones to kill the woman. And Jesus said something to them that sent them flying. And then he spoke of steadfast love and mercy. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Wow. But maybe we should ask here, what if she had done it again? And they had brought her to Jesus. Would he have said, okay, Now I've had it. (laughs) You're never going to change. The men were right. You deserve to die. No. 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 If she had been brought again, Jesus would have said the same thing to her. Do you know why? Because only in the presence of such love Did this woman ever have any chance in the world to change? And the same thing is true in the story of the hunger of Jesus' disciple on the Sabbath day when they picked the corn to eat. And some really good, fine, wonderful, upstanding, church-going, religious folks found a verse of Scripture that condemned them. But notice that Jesus corrected the way they read the Bible. Some of us need to be corrected by the way we read the Bible. 
He declared that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. And mark it down. If we handle Scripture the way those who condemned did, rather than the way Jesus understood it, then you're going to get Scripture wrong. And you'll condemn others. Not long ago, the president of a Christian school said he wanted his school to be Christ-centered. And the only way he knew to be Christ-centered was to be Bible-centered. No, the only way to be Christ-centered is to have the love of God-centered and neighbor-centered. That's the way to read the Bible. And that's the way to be Bible-centered. Okay, let's turn now for a few moments to how to navigate with love. For Paul, love was about the practical matters of everyday life. It was about being patient and kind and tender-hearted. Doesn't try to have its own way. It's not easily provoked. And the term he uses to describe our lives most is the words walking in love. That's his most succinct description of the Christian life. But again, we ask, what does it mean? Now, I'm going to give you a few points. These are navigation points that I think would help us in terms of walking in love. Number one, walking in love begins with a non-negotiable commitment to the value of a human being. That sits at the very core of the great commandment. Miss this point, and you'll miss navigation of your life. This is the most important thing. Nothing has the value of a human being. The vision of Jesus for a human being is the greatest vision ever announced, found in the briefest form. And it's a vision that was spelled out by Paul, spelled out by the other writers of the New Testament in terms of how a human being lives in a community as well as how a human being walks in the midst of the world. We need to remember, people aren't yearning to be religious. They're yearning for a better way of life. And the best religion, Jesus says, and this is so hard sometimes for us to hear, Jesus says the best religion hides the religion in the closet and walks in love as a new human being. Number two, walking in love gives us our best clue on how to deal with other religions and the philosophies of the earth. How do we deal with secularism or humanism or atheism or world religion? Do we single them out for attack? Attack and condemnation. Here's something profoundly interesting. Paul never singled out and named the leading philosophy, even religion, of his day, which was Stoicism. Stoicism was by far the philosophy practiced by all the people in his day. It most guided virtually every life, but Paul never named it and never attacked it. As Paul Sampley, the world's, one of the world's leading scholars on Paul, says that Paul looked at these things that he picked and chose, those things that suited his purposes, and he incorporated those. And the things that didn't suit his purpose, he either ignored or he restructured them according to his own understanding of the gospel. That's the way we deal with these things. Paul didn't fear contamination. Adaptability was at the very core of his posture when he said, I have become all things to all men. To Jews, I just became a Jew. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. And to those weak, I became as one weak. And sometimes today, When we try to do that, there are always those who are very, very religious standing around willing to condemn us and accuse of selling out. But we're not selling out. We keep this basic core. He said, I do all of this to win some. And shouldn't we do the same thing, take the same approach 
with the philosophies and, 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 and religions of our day. With Paul, we can't begin with big declarations of judgment. How can we expect to have a redemptive relationship with someone if we start out with strident judgment and condemnation? It makes no sense. And we know that won't work if we ever tried it romantically. You know, we meet somebody that we're really interested in, and we say, now, you're all wrong, and you're condemned, and you're a mess, but I can fix you. How about a date? (laughs) Number three, walking in love means you will be very careful with your speech. Colossians 4, conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders. Let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you'll know how to answer everyone. Sometimes, sometimes, hear this, please. I cannot believe what I hear coming out of the mouths of Christians. The world is watching and listening. In the 90s, I remember being at a table one evening near Washington, D.C. with maybe eight or ten people, and the subject of then-President Clinton's sin came up, and some awful things were said, probably reflecting political views more than love. I said nothing. But after a while, One of them said, Landon, you've been awfully quiet. Do you have anything to, any thoughts on this? And I said, well, I've been thinking of what I would say to the Clinton's young daughter if she came to me and said, Landon, what about my dad? You see, this took the conversation back to what it means to be human and gave us a chance to walk in love. And if I had talked to her, I would have used kind and gentle language. I would have been clear about the mistake that her father had made, but I would have also been clear that we all come short of the glory of God. And that in the presence of love, any failure can be overcome. I hope that's all right to say. Number four, to the social issues of our day. Many of these are enmeshed in political rhetoric as well as religious. Things like the rich and poor, documented, undocumented workers, the gay issues, Muslims, the environment. We must be very careful that we do not let our minds on these issues be shaped by political rhetoric. Our minds are to be shaped by the mind of Christ. Paul will say at the end of his most extensive comments about how to live among outsiders, in 1 Corinthians 5 to 10, he said, be imitators of me even as I am of Christ. That is, you imitate the way I walk among outsiders as I imitate the way Jesus walked among outsiders. Well, I'm not done, but the clock says that I'm to be done. Keep going. <laughs> Well, let me just quickly say, when we're looking at all these issues that just upset us so much and create so much strife and division, here's what's most important. You know, we can talk about all the rights and wrongs, but what the most important thing is for you to be the kind of person that a Muslim would want to walk beside
The most important thing is for you to be the kind of human being that a transgender would want to walk beside. And why is that true? The best thing that ever happened to a human being was to be brought into the presence of the human Jesus. There, all the things could happen to a person that needed to happen for that person to have an abundant life, and we are called to be such a person in our world today. These are hard issues, but hard cases make bad laws, and we have to be careful there. We have to figure these things out. We've made progress in understanding slavery and divorce and the place of women, and we'll make progress figuring these things out. But while we do it, please don't damage a lot of people along the way. I have members of my family who over-divorce were put out of the church or said they couldn't be a part of it, and they died in loneliness. Today, they'd be accepted. So let's don't make those same mistakes today. You know what I decided? I decided years ago that I was just going to love everybody and let God sort it out. <laughs> I, treat, I treat everyone I meet as if they're going to heaven. Boy, it simplifies things. <laughs> I'll just list the rest. Walking in love means living in the interest of others. That's the one idea that historians tell us that the Christian community contributed to the world of ideas. Walking in the interest of others. Number six, walking in love means you will not hurt another human being. Every morning, one of the things I do as my own discipline is remind myself today, I will not hurt any human being. Words hurt, looks hurt, behavior hurts. Number seven, walking in love means never put yourself between another person and God. God welcomes human beings, and sin never, dim, ne, sin never dims that welcome because no sin is as strong as God's love. Amen. I love this quote from Augustine. He said, many whom God has, the church does not have. And many whom the church has, God does not have. Number eight, God will judge those outside. That's what Paul says, and it'll take a load off your shoulders. <laughs> number nine, follow the things that make for peace. And number ten, don't let anything take away your joy. Amen. And so let me leave you with these words. This is a time for a little recalculating to be done. Let us open our hearts more than ever before. And let's let God restore us while there's still time. And let's emerge with life and speech that captures the attention of our neighbors and the world and that will make them say, I want to walk the way you walk. I want your God to be my God. Let's bring on that day. Thank you.